Hello, everybody. We're excited to have you here today for, I believe, what is the finale to Ref AI, which is going to be a live taping of the podcast Unsolicited Feedback. I'm your host, Fareed Mosavat, and we have done a ton of interesting episodes on various AI and product topics over the past couple of seasons. But I wanted to point out for any of you who haven't listened to the pod, you can find it pretty easily on any podcast uh, app by searching unsolicited feedback. We've done some great interviews and conversations with a lot of the people that have been part of this conference today. We've had a, a multiple episodes with Claire Vo, who was a guest uh, pre uh, earlier, as well as Kieran Flanagan from HubSpot, Ravi Mehta. And also, if you, you want to get really technical, we have a wonderful episode with Ben Cuss, who's the CTO at Box, about strategies for building AI tools and features and capabilities at a really deep technical level. If you want to think more about the future of AI and more in the clouds type future vision things, we have some great episodes with Aaron White, who's the CEO of a company called Appy People, as well as with Nabil Hyatt, who is an investor at Spark Capital that are more on the future, future side of AI. So we're excited to have you here today. And today our guest is the one and only Andrew Chen who's going to talk, be talking, we're going to have a conversation, a discussion, and we will have some time for Q&A to talk about a concept that he's written about recently on his brand new Substack called the AI S-curve. We're excited to have Andrew here. Andrew, I've given my own intro, but I'll let you, you hardly need an intro, but I think I'll let you do your own <laughs> introduction and tell us a little bit about yourself and what we're going to talk about today. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks everyone for, for joining us. Fareed and I hang out and talk all the time. So you get to see a little people into our uh, random conversations we like to have. But yes, I am a general partner at Andreessen Horowitz. I've been at the firm now for six years. Most recently, we have kicked off a new gaming ecosystem effort at the firm. And so there's a new vertical fund called A16Z Games, where we've been investing in game studios, a lot of the technology around gaming. And these days that happens to be a lot of AI technologies for 3D assets, for building the worlds, for powering the characters, et cetera. And then also gamified consumer apps. So think of that as like Duolingo for X, as another big area and the Twitches and Discords of, of the world. And so that's what I'm working on these days. And then before that, I led you know, a bunch of the growth teams at Uber during the, some of the hyper growth years. I've written a book called The Cold Start Problem. I was involved with getting Reforge off the ground with Brian Balfour and a bu bunch of other things. And so, yeah, Fareed, thank you for having me on here and, and, and glad we could chat. Yeah, and Andrew brings up a really great point. This is not normally a typical interview type podcast. The idea of unsolicited feedback is to bring product leaders generally people that I know relatively well so that we have a good rapport and banter and just shine a light on the types of conversations that product leaders and product people are having over dinner, over coffee, over text message, et cetera, and bring them out into the open. So we're gonna do a little bit of that today, although this will be a little bit of a different style because Andrew, being someone who's written a ton about a lot of different topics and not just with his more new Substack, but a blog that you should check out because it's got a lot of gold there. I've learned a lot from it personally myself. We're going to dive into some of the things that he's been thinking about recently around AI, how it pertains to things like investment, to growth strategies, to product strategies, et cetera. So to kick it off, I want to just talk about, Andrew, why don't you just explain what an S-curve is? Let's just start with the most foundational basics. So what is an S-curve? What do you mean by an S-curve? And what do you see happening with AI right now? Yeah, definitely. And I, I put a couple links to, to to this topic that are related to today's conversation that we'll be covering. And so for folks that want to go deeper, you could do that on, on, on Substack. So look, so what this graph is really showing is it's showing on the left axis, the adoption in the United States as a percentage of the US population. And then the X axis is then the year that, that spans left and left. And you'll see some really interesting things. One of the most interesting things on here is that you have inventions like the electricity or the telephone or the clothes washer, et cetera, that literally took 50 plus years to get to mainstream penetration. Um, and the amazing thing is as you go over to the right and you look at the computer, you look at cell phone, you look at the internet, I wish this graph actually had Instagram on here or it had 
at ChatGPT <laughs> and some of these other things. Because I, because I think we all know that it would look like this. It would look literally straight up. And, and a couple observations on what's going on with the S-curve. The first is that really the S-curve kind of shows the process at which you have early adopters and very early products and you have this like very slow growth curve and then it picks up and eventually hits saturation. So that ends up be looking, looking like an S-curve. And also that these S-curves are looking faster and faster as technologies evolve. And what that means for us all as product people and technologists is that <clears throat> it's important to understand where you actually are on the S-curve because it leads to very different dynamics in terms of what you want to use. We all remember when the mobile phone first came out that every week we were checking out new apps and we would go, literally we would open up the app store and be like, what are the new apps? And people would just go and download like the latest flashlight app, the latest fart app, the latest like whatever app, whatever was, whatever was fun at the time, we would go do that. And then, and then one of the interesting problems these days is now that we're 15 years into, into the mobile S curve, we're now at a point where like, how often do you go and download a new app? Someone emails you, Hey, I added you on this cool new service, this cool new app. You don't rush to the app store and download it. You like reply back with, what is this? Is this spam? Is this real? Like we have a natural skepticism that comes from that. And so to me, the S curve really encompasses a lot of things. I think it's factually just the penetration of kind of various technologies over time. But then for us as product leaders and, and, and technologists, it's about understanding where we are in the S-curve because we have to have actually very different strategies and tactics based on where, where we sit. I think that's great. So let's use, I'm going to stop the share because from here, we're just going to do a little bit of a, we're going to do more of a conversation than a presentation. But I thought that graph was really interesting to show. So let's use the S-curve a little bit as a framework for thinking about what kinds of products we're building, where they are on the S-curve and different strategies we should take. So you described the early stages of mobile, but I'd say that mobile or SaaS or a lot of these things are maybe later S-curve type yeah, developments, that's right? right? That's but right. AI, is it's a technology, but it's also a way of building. It's also a type of product. I think that's obviously at the earliest stages. So how do you think about the differences between as a product leader, how you should be thinking about building and launching products that are early in the S curve versus say on the ramp versus at the more peak adopted. If we yeah. use that as a three stages, what's different about each of those and how would you describe them? Yeah. You know, I think there's a reason when we go back and we look at early internet and we're like Craigslist, you're like, oh my God, what does that look like? What does that look the way it does? But, and yet it gets a lot of usage, right? And then these days, if you, you're playing with, with VR, there's a new app I want everyone to try. If you have a, you can brush off your request and install it, which is, it's called Gorilla Tag. And it's the first really working product on the quest. It's done a hundred million dollars of revenue. You're literally this pixelated gorilla and you're just using your arms to move around. And it's just really fun. It's so basic. And, and then that's another version. And then by the way, <laughs> all the AI products that we've been trying, we're just typing into text boxes. There's very little that you do. We were just talking about flashlight apps a second ago. The through line on all of these products when you're in the novelty phase is there is a lot of just consumer interest during that point to just try things, okay? Yeah. And what that means is, it means that your cost of acquisition is really low. You have very high word of mouth. You have very high conversion rates. Your top of funnel is amazing, right? And all you need to do in order to get people pumped during this phase is you need to have one key feature, which is called the, it actually, it works feature, right? It That's actually less, works feature. Yeah, it actually yeah. works. <laughs> yeah, it actually feature. works. Holy crap, it actually yeah. works. And if you have the it works feature in the earliest days, you your product could look like shit. It could sit inside of a Discord instance. It could, it could have all blue links. It could be anything, but as long as it works, people will be excited to try it out and it will spread and spread, right? Yeah. And I, th I think if you were to hit the fast forward button to where we are in a lot of the late stage points, we're actually at a point where of the S curve, which is really about brand differentiation, right? If you think about shoes or you think about, you think about clothes, you think about watches, you think about these things, these are really product categories that have very low levels of differentiation, right? In terms of functional, like feature set ability, and so what ends up happening is you differentiate using design, you differentiate using brand, you differentiate using what, what this means when it, when it is all about kind of the look and feel of something. And then there's this middle part of like flipping between that novelty phase 
And, and so maybe I'll fill in the middle one now. We're going out of order, yeah. but it's like no novelty phase. And then the middle thing I would say is like functionality phase, right? This is like when you truly can be differentiated based on functionality. And then the last part is like differentiating based on like brand and design and aesthetics, right? right? Kind of three phases of the S-curve. And so AI is just, it's we're in the novelty phase, right? Yeah. So it working at all is like so amazing. We're so excited. And, and what's going to happen in, and I don't know how long it's going to take, but maybe it might be 12 months or 18 months or whatever. We're going to get out of this phase and it's going to move on to a new thing where we're not as wowed. If you guys all remember, we were all so wowed by having six fingered generated images that were just okay. We were yeah. all so excited about it 12 months ago. I, I don't see those being shared on social media as much anymore. Right. Now it's, you got to do video. You got to have Donald Trump rapping to a synthesize. That's the only way we'll yeah. get excited about it and want to share it. We're, we're past the novelty phase. I think what's just to double back on this lot novelty phase thing and these different three stages, I think it's a really important framework to lay out a lot of the discourse that has been going on for the past like three or four years around what is an MVP? What is a good enough product? And you've seen, I've seen a lot of discussion. We've talked about it on the podcast before, posts from companies like Linear and others that are like the era of the MVP is dead, right? And the idea of the MVP being dead is really a function of the part of the technology adoption curve we're in or in the categories you're building in, right? So of course, if you're building, let's say, linear, you're entering a very crowded, very mature category. We're building a it just works feature. It isn't good enough. There is something that works in each of these categories, right? It That's needs right. to be better designed. It needs to be really focused on a narrow subset of people who have really high demands. And it needs to meet those demands, right? The minimum market requirements of what a product needs to include or higher, the level of expectation you have for speed, functionality, et cetera. But if you look at the, I, I have two AI products in mind that I think are like the epitome of old school MVP. And I think I'm selling them a little short because the tech behind it is actually like really deep and really hard, right? ChatGPT behind it has the GPT model, which is a not an MVP. That is a complicated, difficult, hard thing to do. Right. And, and by the way, GPT one and two and three. Two and three, and three exactly. exactly. We're, we're pretty Set far. Set a series of research projects, right? But the product itself is like the epitome of an MVP. It was literally a text box you type into and it generates answers. The first, now we have all these other bells and whistles, calling Google, integrating with docs, like generating code, all this stuff. But at the beginning it was like no images, no nothing. It was just a very simple MVP and it blew up, right? Was so successful. And it's, I don't know how many people know this, but they didn't expect that. This was like I think the emails internally are, we're releasing a small like beta test release of a fun new product shouldn't impact anybody. And it turned out to be like the fastest adopted product of all time, I think. That's right. That's right. And, yeah. and, and, and it's almost like a counter brand for everyone that has worked in product and has done like long brand studies. What should we name our product? Is it the right, does it convey the right attributes, blah, blah, blah. They literally named a product chat GPT. <laughs> <laughs> and it, who cares about branding? It works, right? right? That's all you that's all it means. You, know, you can name your you can name your product anything and it would have worked. And the other great example is Midjourney, which I think is an even more extreme example. Yes. Because the friction to use Midjourney is really high. Like it's text only prompting in Discord. So if you've never used Discord, you have to figure out how to do that, et cetera. And I think there's a lot of positive benefits to that, but that I don't want to talk about. But the friction doesn't matter because the it just works is so cool, so novel, so new that you can get away with breaking all the rules of product growth and product experience because the level between what you expect and what the actual is so high that people will talk about it. They'll drive it. Like word of mouth is driven by the difference between expectations and reality. And these products were so much higher than your expectations that they just exploded. And But my question for you is given how fast we're going steep, are we already past the novelty phase for <laughs> AI products? Or maybe each new holy crud moment is one of these. But if you're building, say, I don't know, perplexity versus ChatGPT, the bar is a lot higher. Yeah, that's right. It just works, isn't good enough anymore. Like, how are you thinking about that, especially as you 
talk to startups and people building early stage products. Are we moving faster than ever through the novelty phase? And so is it even worth looking at? <laughs> yeah, that's right. Well, I, I do think that the, these S curves are moving faster. And to give you guys a sense of, I was going to drop in a funny link, which is a little bit about the history of the S curve concept. It was actually pioneered and studied in the 1960s. And it was actually used primarily to study the diffusion of agricultural methodologies. Okay. And it was and, and it was studied by this guy named named Everett Rogers, who was studying rural sociology at Ohio State University, right? So these ideas have been around for a long time, right? This is like a major area of research. And 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 so I think it's absolutely my contention that you look at the data and these S curves are moving faster and faster. Technology is becoming advancing that much faster. The consumers and the customers find out because of social media, because of podcasting, because of everything that's out there, they find out about these innovations much faster. And because of that's caused this like very steep increase. And in my business in, in venture capital, we often see the novelty effect because of the fact that we're often now, companies are going from zero to a million of ARR in days, yeah. right? It's literally days, right? And you're like, holy shit, that's incredible. It is incredible. But also when you look at the retention rates of the ARR now, when you, once it's stretched over time, sometimes the retention is like just okay, right? Yeah. So you're getting this huge boost up front and then you end up with a little bit of the, the revenues, a little bit more churny because people are off like trying out. Like I have a chat GPT subscription. I also have a cloud subscription. Maybe I might add on another one, but at some point I'm going to probably consolidate down to one subscription. It'll be a matter of time, I think. So I do think that we're moving much more quickly. We're much, we're, we have much higher expectations because of the novelty effects. There's a funny thing of like, how long, how many exposures do you need before the novelty effect goes away? And I think right. what we're seeing is that, yeah, you can only look at, we're all blown away by Sora, but if it goes into everyone's hands and then all of a sudden we're able to um, see it every day in, and day out on social media, within a few months, we'll become inoculated and- right. We won't just try a product simply because, because it's great. So I, I think that's all happening. And I think what it means for, from a product decisioning standpoint, what it means is that you often have to think a little bit ahead where if you, if you're not able to get something out there in this next six months, then you have to think, okay, yeah, maybe you do have to invest a little bit more in design or the ha there has to be a little bit of a hero yeah. use case where the UX is just a little bit slicker in order to get people excited about it. So I think that that's absolutely true. Yeah, I think there's an interesting dynamic here where being early helps you benefit from this novelty effect, right? Like people are excited to try new stuff. They are excited when somebody's building an AI tool for their specific job that has never existed before and helps them do new things. But then it's a race to retention, right? It is a race to build the fully featured product, et cetera. And it just because you were first doesn't mean you will be That's successful right. at That's that. That's right. The other... An experiment that we've run many times as an industry is if you have a software product and the retention is horrible, but it's growing really fast at the, at the top line, does that, and you're able to then raise a bunch of money and hire a bunch of people, how easy is it to fix the retention? And the answer, <laughs> Freed's laughing because the answer is really super fucking hard. Yeah. It just turns out that typically new products either have it or they don't have it. And if you don't have great retention from day one and you get this huge spike of novelty driven traffic, I think what's going to end up happening is you're going to get yourself into a position where you have very, a lot of money, a lot of valuation, you have a big spike of registered users, and then all of a sudden, like you're not going to be able to keep it and you're going to be dead in the water. Yep. Now on the flip side, I think it's one of the reasons to be excited about highly vertical AI products is because a lot of those highly vertical AI products, a lot of the value add isn't just all the customization they're doing on a particular vertical. It's also what they're doing around compliance and IT security yeah. and having account managers and the GTM and all these things that are earned secrets in order to make the product highly functional. And then in that way, even if the product functionality is only just somewhat better, <coughs> you still are, I think, able to brute force potentially a lot of stickiness off of that. But yeah. I think we're also going to, there's a, there's a, there's an unpublished draft in my Substack right now that's called the AI Reckoning. That's basically a prediction of, and I don't know what it'll be. Maybe it'll be two years or something like that, but there's going to be a period where the novelty effect wears off 
And then a lot of the companies that maybe over-raised capital uh, relative to their retention are going to be left holding holding the bag on all this. Yeah, I think that's inevitable. I think it's fine. We're going to get a lot of great AI companies no matter what, but that that is going to happen at some point. Yeah. You're already seeing it on some of the things that were like the earliest pieces of novelty and excitement at the earliest stages of the AI like revolution once ChatGPT was released. And specifically, I'm just talking about co-pilots and products, right? It used to be they were like, oh my God, there's a co-pilot that can help me navigate this tool and I can ask it questions and can do complex things. And now you're already seeing the backlash, which is not every tool needs a co-pilot. These things don't work that well. I'm disappointed. And hopefully we'll see more of a shift towards like more interesting ways of implementing this tech. So you're certainly seeing it already. We yeah, have an agenda, I, I think, but I'm think, gonna blow it up a little bit if you don't mind. Andrew. Actually, finish up what you were saying, sorry. Yeah, I was just gonna go to a slightly tangential point on this, which is I think it's also one of the reasons why the other big shakeout that we're gonna see is what is a better approach, the strong form uh, AI approach that potentially reinvents user experiences yeah. or a more of an augmented kind of weak form approach. And I'll get a, give a good example of this. Um, you know, take video, right? It could be that the future of video is something where we text, we put text into these boxes. It generates little clips. We move the clips around. We do the whole thing. And as a result of that, we're able to edit and build entire videos the way that one of the, one of our A16Z companies, Descript does. Yeah which is really a totally new rethinking of the interface. It's all about, it's almost like editing a text document in order to yeah. move. We use it. Descript for the podcast. It's okay, awesome. great, yeah. So, <laughs> so that's one version, which is a wholesale rethinking. Or the other version is, it's actually gonna be like Final Cut Pro. And you're gonna, you're gonna use it with a timeline and with the clips and all these other things. And then occasionally, if there's gaps or things or whatever, you're gonna right click and say, okay, generate this bridge or generate this B-roll yep. or whatever, and then it's gonna fill it in. And so that's like a strong form, weak form kind of version of the product. The more that it is like a co-pilot for incumbent products, the more that the incumbent tech companies are likely to yes. win because they can just obviously add it to their distribution. They have all the minimum market requirements. They have all of the product adoption. That's right. They have all of the users. They have all of the benefits. They have the right? users. Yeah. They have the contracts. They have the product. By Thank the way, you. they also have the compute. They yep. also have access to all the, they already have a bunch of PhDs running around like yep. doing AI research. And they have a bunch of people who are trained on all the little mini vagaries of their products. I used to work right. in like Maya and 3D animation tools. Don't move anything. I know where everything is. If you make that just simpler and it works, I'm going to stick around there. That's right. That's yeah. right. And then on the flip side, if, if you're able to reinvent the UX in a big way, then that's obviously great for startups because then it's going to move us into a different direction. And then by the way, like maybe both are going to happen, right? Maybe right. there's going to be a human in the loop set of products that are, that are, that are a little bit more like co-pilot-esque. And then there's going to be a set, which are more for a current, almost like the Canva strategy or something like that, mm -hmm. like attracting people that aren't currently part of the market segment into it. And so anyway, so I guess my, yeah. my broader point there is this next phase beyond novelty is going to be about trying to figure out some of these exact questions. Yes. What is the actual functionality on a per vertical level that will actually get you stickiness and retention within these categories? I'll, I'll just riff on this one for a second. Like I said, we had an agenda, but we've already blasted through it in classic unsolicited feedback style, which I love, which is I'm not a huge fan, especially for deep, complicated, creative work on text as the primary interface for interacting with these tools. Personally, I just, I don't, having worked in 3D animation and games and other places where like fine control is really important to the final outcome. I do think that we're going to have great AI driven features that help artists, creative people, et cetera, move a lot more quickly and do things they couldn't do otherwise. But I'm not sure typing, there's a scene with Andrew Chen standing in front of a boardwalk on the ocean is the right interaction model. I've seen a lot of cool stuff. There's some really cool tools. Crea.ai stands out for me, K-R-E-A, where you actually like interact by drawing and then it fills in the gaps with using AI tools. I think that's really cool. I think there's stuff like that. There's a guy on Twitter who's been using these tools to do a lot of interesting stuff and piecing stuff together. I think Descript is an awesome example of using AI to create a new type of interface that is not 
typing like, I'd like to remove all the ums and ahs, and I'd like to shorten this piece up and make it more of a YouTube short, but rather using AI as a methodology or machine learning as a methodology to create interfaces that couldn't exist otherwise. So yes. I'm really excited about those paradigms personally. And, 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 I, and I think those are the most exciting because they're in some ways, they're actually the most similar to previous platform shifts, yeah. right? The reason why we went by going from mainframes to de personal PCs to the web to mobile, the reason why that created successively new generations of companies was because when you're going desktop software to web or web to mobile, there was a different set of companies that became successful at it, yeah. right? It just turned out that WhatsApp ended up being the standard, not ICQ and AOL Instant Messenger for yep. various reasons, right? And and I think the- But they look the pretty close, right? Yeah, like, exactly. They're not yeah. huge, yeah. They're not huge jumps, but like, yeah, there was, you have Tinder and then previously there was like eHarmony and there was this and that, and there were some changes like the swiping and the this and that drove that. But I, but I think the, the interesting point with AI on this is, and this, you mentioned this Fareed right at the beginning, is in many ways, it's still unclear what exactly AI as a technological paradigm, what it actually is. Yeah. If it's more of a UX type paradigm and it allows people to invent new user experiences that previously couldn't exist, that's great for startups. That's great for new products yeah. because that means that there's a lot, there's going to be a lot of people out of position because they're going to be building like Final Cut Pro Plus and trying to work on old paradigms and UXs at a moment when what they should really be doing is rethinking the whole thing from right. scratch, from first principles like what is actually determined. That would be amazing. It's also very possible that it turns out, because this is the amazing thing about AI, is that it is the thing that the incumbents are the most excited about and that they're embracing very quickly. And in every single one of these larger companies, as Fareed, everybody is setting OKRs that have AI related yeah. insight. It is, it is like a wholesale reinvention of some of these larger companies in a way that I haven't seen. It, it certainly yeah. didn't happen with mobile until we were a couple of years into it. I think this is what's been, and actually was supposed to be my second question, but we, we jumped off, but we answered back. it. We we'll double yeah. back to it, which is unlike previous platform shifts, like you described, like Salesforce is like the first cloud B2B SaaS type company, right? I don't even think they called it that, but they had the big software with a line through it, like idea that you wouldn't install software. They were the first, like big cloud CRM replacing previously home install, like on your own data center installed CRM type systems. And that was because the incumbents at the time are making so much money, are so well retained and keep their big customers for so long, et cetera, that they didn't have to care about cloud and they were super slow to it. Same thing happened with mobile, right? We saw this like messaging, inter all kinds of even enterprise, but also primarily on consumer or big shifts and the with the exception of maybe Facebook, who was like really good at this and was still pretty early, a lot of people were caught sleeping at the wheel and had to pay up big dollars to buy up some of these new players. But you're seeing a totally different thing with AI, with the incumbents, like everybody's all in, right? Like right. every, right. look at Google's announced like 40 Gemini powered products, yeah. like Microsoft, Microsoft. Re Apple. announced their core. Apple, who's traditionally a late mover and was late, has actually, I think, done something slightly different, which is more in the line of what we were just talking about, which is like, how can we have machine learning make new types of interfaces, like for the notes and the calculator app that everybody's excited about, et cetera, which I'm ex I think is really cool. Um, but I think that changes the game for startups a little bit, because you could count on people being asleep at the wheel for That's two right. or three years. That's and right. I think you've laid out some things that are that I think are smart, which is if it's this kind of paradigm shifting UX, then startups have a chance. And that's where you should focus. If it's add chat to an existing product, then you're probably to right. like that's toast. Right. Yeah, so to, to me- What to me, other things like do you think scariest... startups should be thinking about given that incumbents are running, like really yeah. running, like they yeah. learned from the last time? I think, th I think that's why the hard, some of the hardest things are probably- horizontal AI technologies that where there's going to be 50 changes in who, who leads the category over the next few years. So if you're building something that's, that's in video generation, you better go find, you better take over the market really quickly or find an amazing niche very quickly. Otherwise there's just every, it's just too obvious. Everyone wants to get into it. I think that's a very similar and interesting thing with 2D as well. 
I think it's pretty clear that 2D image generation is going to just be part of part of all yeah. the LLM products and it'll just be table stakes. And I think that in itself is, is also quite difficult. If we go back to mobile for one second, if I were to actually pick out the specific products during those three phases, I would say the novelty phase was most characterized by, yeah, flashlight apps, fart yeah. apps, like they're silly, low retention, but you could build a top 50 app yeah. during the time during that. The functionality phase, like what I'm calling the functionality phase, that's where people discover unique new things about the platform that... Right. Uh, allow you to do something that you couldn't have previously yep. done before. Uber social great- networks on demand, these types That's of right. things. Yeah, right? things that yeah. are using the camera, they're using the GPS, they're using mapping capabilities, they're contacts, using, whatever they're it using is. Using contacts, yeah. they're using in-app payments. They're all they're using the unique capabilities of the platform yeah. to do something new. <laughs> and then I think the brand phase is you, you might say that a lot of gaming match three gaming experiences are in that, right? Why oh, do you play sure. one versus the other? There's a million of them. It's just because one's prettier than the other. Or Maybe even messaging apps are in there. It's like, I use Telegram to talk to some friends. I use WhatsApp to talk to other friends. They're all interchangeable. It's fine. And it just depends on what it is. And so I think in the same way, I think we're going to see that type of S-curve happen as well. I think right now there's a lot of high novelty products where I'm like, I don't really know where I would use this, but wow, it's really cool. And we're going to go from that (laughs) to, I think unique capabilities for unique markets. I'm I'm sure given our audience is a lot of product managers and designers and engineering managers and companies, there's going to be very specific like PM oriented products and engineering oriented products and so on that will be very customized to your workflows and be able to really help you in a deep way. And then, yeah. And then I don't know how many years from now we'll end up with like less differentiated products over time. And maybe we'll end up in a thing where there's, there's tons of open source models and you can swap them in and out. And in different things, use different things under the hood, but you almost don't even think about it. And maybe that's great. I I think it's an exciting time ahead of us, but I think for startups, I think right now heading into the functionality phase, I think you have to, it's going to become more and more about the app slayer, AI app slayer. There's only, you could make the argument that there's going to be a dozen foundation model companies and maybe that they'll even further consolidate. We're going to just eventually run out of senses. It's like we have text, we have video, we have images, we have sound, we have music. We could name like five other things or maybe 10 other things, but we're not going to name a hundred other things that kind of go in there. And so then the next phase is going to be that functionality of, okay, now that we've built all these pretty good foundational models, what are the actual product applications that sit on top? What are the verticals? How are they going to be priced? I think it's going to be a very exciting period of a lot of new AI apps being created. Yeah, I'll I'll jump to a couple of questions while we're here that I think are relevant to what we're talking about right now from Sravenod. We have a question, which is, how do you successfully and strongly differentiate your product if you're leveraging an existing foundational models that other people also have access to? You're talking about this app slayer, but how should companies think about differentiation and retention, really? Let's just think about like at the core, how do I retain and avoid just pure novelty if I'm building on top of things that everybody else has access to? Yeah, that's right. The good news is if you're building a consumer app, all of us in consumer have been dealing with this for the last 20 years now because (laughs) building any consumer app is trivial. Like everyone can build Uber, anyone can build X, like from a technology standpoint, the things that actually keep people engaged and sticky over long periods of times are things like viral loops and network effects and all my friends are on it. So I'm on it. Oh, I get the lowest prices on here, et cetera, et cetera. And that's for consumer. And I think that will just continue. So I think what, what it may turn out to be is that people end up using this class of consumer products primarily for novelty And then once they come into the product and they've like experienced in the novelty value, then they're only going to stick around and use it if all their friends are on there. Right. That's the consumer. And for the Instagram's a great example, right? Yeah, that's right. A ton of filter. Everyone can build Instagram. Super easy. Like the technology is not the. But also the novelty of the filter is what brought people in. That's right. And then the network effects (laughs) and social networks are what kept them there and make it the most powerful app in the world right now, or one of the That's biggest right. apps in the world. That's right. And then funny enough is then now a couple of years later, the number of photos that use filters is like approaching zero. Yeah. It's now not a thing. So it turned out the filters were just a novelty effect and then we got rid of them. And then on B2B, it goes towards what we were just talking about. Either it's network effects, the way that Zoom and Slack and yeah. Dropbox and others have done it, where it's a collaboration tool, you use it because your coworkers use it, or over time it becomes because you're laser focused on a vertical. You figured out all the compliance issues. You're building in healthcare. You figured out all the like compliance issues. You're HIPAA compliant. You 
you sell through the right organizations, your go-to-market is like extremely, those become the things that end up- Or just switching costs. I met a company recently, awesome, really high novelty effect, really fast growth. Like nothing I've ever seen before. Building in a relatively small vertical, I'm not gonna talk about specifically who it is. My recommendation to them was like, you need to own, run the table on the work, the rest of the workflow, especially their, this, it's a B2B product. So I'm like, own their customer workflow. Some of this stuff's not going to be fancy AI stuff, but if you get yourself, use the input, the new, it just works to create the opportunity to start owning the boring stuff. That's the pathway. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's, it's just like normal, the normal stuff, network effects, switching costs, virality, these things still matter. I think there's a lot of talk about AI is new and it's totally different, but it's still fundamentally the same, like macro loops or long-term differentiators are still the same ones they've always been, right? That's right, that's right, exactly. And so it may be that we're going through a phase right now where people wanna try things because of AI, but then you stay because of all the normal kind of vanilla reasons that people people do it. Yeah, so I wanna, Let's see, there's a couple different directions we could go in, but I want to jump to one that's really like tactical and growth oriented. You had an article uh, a while ago, I can't remember exactly when, that you talked about the sequencing of growth, right? That most companies take, which is first you start with acquisition because you don't have any users (laughs) and you try to figure out how to drive better acquisition. Then you have some users and they're not successful with your product. So you start looking at working on early activation, then to like engagement, retention, and then only then to reactivation, bringing old users back to the product. And I, I'm pretty sure you wrote this blog post, <laughs> like almost certain of it. And it would be really embarrassing if you did it. But <laughs> I think about that all the time because I work with these companies and it really is 90% of the time activation and first time user experience is the area of highest leverage. Yes. For companies that have some organic growth. That's right. My question for you is, do you believe the high level of novelty and excitement and really high aha moment in these AI products, which is the first time use is like blows your mind, right? Like the first time I saw an AI profile picture generator, I was like, whoa, that's so cool. Do you think it changes the sequencing for companies and what they should be spending their time and energy on? Do you think that like middle piece of retention and reactivation are more important than they would have been in previous platform shifts? Yeah. So first, I think this might be the article you're talking about. This is, I was basically showing it's, there's a cool graph on here and maybe I'll, you got, you guys can open it and, and scroll down, but what it shows is basically all of the different, the top 10 apps versus the top 50 versus the top 100 and the top 5,000 and retention curves averaged out for everything. Yeah. And what is that actually all the retention curves actually all look the same. <laughs> It's yeah. just that they have an offset in the first seven days around them. And so, yeah, so to Freed's point, the whole interesting thing is that like maybe everyone's retention is similarly shaped. It's just that what happens in the first seven days determines whether or not you're going to stick or not, it, which is, and Freed, I, I generally agree. I generally tell people that if you're going to be, if you're trying to move your retention number, the first place to start is activation. It's not shipping a bunch of new features. It's just get your people onboarded properly. And that's the best way to to, to do it. So I I fully agree. I think with the AI products, look, I think the way I would tend to think of it is there's going to be a challenge because the viral loop is currently the following. There's a reason why a lot of these products are highly visual in nature. Right. It's because social media is becoming highly visual in nature. And so the viral loop goes something like this. You go into an app, you do your creative thing, you then have something cool and then you share it to, to social media and then that grows and that sort of compounds on its own, okay? And that attracts more people that wanna do the same. And that alignment between the current visual nature of the social media products, platforms, and then the products that are generating this visual content, the fact that they're very closely tied together, that's what's making this whole novelty thing go forward. Now, I think the challenge is the following, which is after you're done making that first thing or the second thing, Probably what the products want you to do is not to just stop there. They actually want you to do this other life cycle of things. They want you to come in, try all the products, try them with your coworkers, invite your coworker, create a shared project, like add assets. Like that's going to be the kind of thing that, that people are going to want to do. And I think the challenge is going to be you're, by doing it, this very social media kind of bottoms up method, you're going to potentially get to a world where there's a lot of users, a lot of top of funnel but they're not actually people that that fit the profile of the folks that monetize really well. 
And this reminds me of, for my book, The Cold Start Problem, Drew Houston, the founder of Dropbox and I sat down. And one of the things he talked about was the early days of Dropbox, people were using it to share pirated movies in Indonesia. You'd have yeah. like hundreds of gigabytes of pirated movies in, in Indonesia that would be on an open Dropbox drive and it would be eating bandwidth, eating storage. And Dropbox had to make the decision, is that a valid use of the product or not? Even though it was quote unquote growing Dropbox, what did it mean? And so what they ended up doing was they ended up actually having a segmentation of what is a high value active user and what is a low value active user. And a high value active user was going to be somebody who used it in more of a work context as compared to a low value. And they ended up doing that segmentation and then removing a lot of the functionality and aiming more of it towards, or aiming more of the new functionality towards the high value actives. And I think right. there's going to be a similar reckoning that will happen in AI world where it'll be like, hey, it turns out using a ton of compute to generate really funny meme videos may not be actually the use case that monetizes the best. It might bring a lot of users, but it's not enough to actually create revenue for, for the companies. Yeah, I think that's exactly right. I think it's really, look, like product market fit isn't just about product, right? It's also about market. You have to iterate on the market and who you're targeting. You may have great fit with people who aren't a good business and you may have to adjust and, and align and move towards those. And I think a lot of these products are going to have to do that just because you have a huge top line doesn't mean you have the right people. And I think this is why... There's some great advice in an article from Linear about how to use a wait list to build an MVP that's really about making sure you start with the right customers instead of just blasting off and letting anyone who wants, because you're going to get feedback, you're going to get usage data, you're going to get all kinds of things from people who may not be the customer you care the most about. So I think that's really good advice. I want to jump in on some other questions. Actually, before we do questions, you're a games investor now. And think, yes. or now you live in LA <laughs> and you're closer to Hollywood and games and those kinds of things than ever. We talked a ton about how tech incumbents have been actually very quick to adopt AI and make it like center of their strategies, et cetera. That's not really what we're seeing in Hollywood and games and, and not just Hollywood, like even tech that's entertainment tech, I think is more reticent to adopt these AI technologies. I'm curious why you think that's the case and what opportunities do you think, what are you looking at and what interesting opportunities do you think that creates for you, for, for yeah. a company? I think we, we, we were just talking a little bit about why it is that the incumbents in tech are just super embracing AI in all these interesting ways. And, and yeah, and, and that is, I moved down to LA two years ago and my wife and I live in Venice. We love it. And that brings us in front of folks from the entertainment industry from time yeah. to time. I always love to debate with them about the nature of AI and what that's going to do. And, and there's a bunch of really interesting things, right? I think the very first thing is that there, there's, there, there's a lot of dynamics around the labor markets there. At the end of the day, Hollywood is a union-driven talent world, right? They have the Screen Actors Guild. They have all the various unions that protect writers and designers and all sorts of people. And, and there's a lot of, there's a lot of worry about AI. I think rather than thinking about it the way that I would hope they would, which is to say, Hey, you junior graphic designer or game designer, you can now use potentially one day you could use all these technologies and put together a Marvel movie right. from zero. And then you could build like a triple a open world movie from zero and you could do all these things. And isn't that amazing? Right. The way that the metaphor I often use is JK Rowling can go to a cafe, type out her book, and then get it in front of tens of millions of people. Imagine being able to do that, not just for books, but for TV series and yeah. full feature films. What's and the equivalent of blogging for feature that's film right. creation, right? Like that's right. A, that's right. Person, a team of one building an amazing exactly. product. A team right? of one building Game of Thrones. Imagine yeah. how cool that, like the, the TV show, imagine how cool that, that would be. And so that would be the kind of like, forward kind of offense thinking world of like, where's entertainment going to go? But I think, unfortunately, there's a lot of folks, and I think especially because of the structure of the of the labor markets in, in Hollywood, that are really thinking about this from more of a defensive point of view. Like, how is this going to take people's jobs? This is, how is it going to disrupt things, et cetera, et cetera. So I think that's I think that's that, that's a major issue. The second thing, look, that we're just going to have to figure out is as technologists, we're used to this world where we're like, of course, Google can crawl the entire internet and show you content from all over the internet. Google did not have to go and strike a partnership contract with every website on the internet right. in order to 
get it indexed into search. So of course you have crawlers and you just organize all the data and then you like help people find things like that's amazing. I think there's a similar conversation that's about to happen with training data, of course, where you have many of you have been following the fact that all the various AI scaling laws, people are concerned that there's a shortage of training data. That's going to be the primary bottleneck, like not mm -hmm. compute, not the actual algorithms, just like training data. And so as a result, there's a huge thirst for training data. And some of that training data, you might end up with content on there that is not meant to be in the corpus. Right. And so there's a lot of discussion and debate about that. And of course, if you're in the world of being these IP holders, that's also a major, major issue. And then maybe the last thing I'll just add on, there's a lot of other things that, that I talk about in my recent essay, and, and I'll just paste it in here, but for folks that want more, but I think the other thing I'll just add is like, it's really hard to hire AI engineers and AI researchers if you're not a tech company, right? When you're a tech company, we kind of work in a world of stock options and upside. And we all know friends who are doing great because they joined the right company at the right time. And, and certainly both Fareed and I have been beneficiaries of this as well. The interesting thing is most of the entertainment industry works more in like less in terms of long running upside kind of relationships and a little bit more revenue sharing and cash orientation. The business model is a little bit worse. And so those things all make it harder to get everybody aligned to think big and to think long-term about all of this. And then maybe my final point on the gaming industry is like the good thing about gaming and the reason why it's such an exciting place for AI is games are truly software companies, right? These are so game studios are, are fundamentally software companies. If you were to walk down the main floor of a game studio company as Fareed was at Zynga back in the day, you look to your left, software engineers. You look to your right, designers in designers, Blender yeah. moving shapes around. Like that's, that, that is what these companies are software companies. And so because of that, they're able to be impacted in all the amazing ways that tech has been impacted over the last couple of years, whether you're talking about open source, cloud computing, obviously all of these AI tools, all these other things, like these are all things that will strongly benefit gaming. And so I'm, so that's why I'm spending a lot of my time there is really, I think this is the entertainment medium of the, of the future for that reason. Yeah. Okay. I have done, tried to do my best for those of you in the audience to integrate as many of the questions that y'all have been asking. I have been paying attention to them into our conversation. I hope if you have a question, they've been answered, but let's speed run a few of these. If you're at Andrew yeah, Rens, an accelerator I'll, I'll speed run. Lightning round. Yeah, yeah, we'll do a little bit of a lightning round on the last couple of questions here uh, for our last few minutes. Jeremy asks an awesome question, which is given the speed of how things are moving, how do you know when to jump in and attack something when you live in a world where the problem can be solved better, faster, cheaper, literally tomorrow? Yeah. And than it can be today. And the cycle is accelerating and repeating every day. How do you think about knowing when the right time to get to the it just works is? Yeah. Look, I think it has a lot to do with your skill set too, right? Because if you're a designer or you're a product thinker that's very focused on designery things, you have a different moment that you're going to jump in compared to somebody who's like a hardcore technical person that just is trying to get it to work at all. And so I think my, my take from a more career standpoint is the best time to jump into a new S curve is uh, yesterday, and you should just do it. and And you can find the problem that best suit that's best suited to your skill set. But th the most important thing is to not miss the S curve, right? Because these super cycles are the things that define technology, that define Silicon Valley. Imagine it being 2010 and you're not in mobile. Imagine being in in, in 2000 and you're not working on the web. That's crazy. This is why we're in the tech industry. Like you got to work on these things. That, that's that, that's my take on it. Yeah. All right. From Natalia, tech is moving so fast. Companies are going to have to reinvent themselves every so often. Do you agree? And if so, what do you think is going to happen with companies with smaller budgets and what can they do to stay relevant given how resource intensive reinvention is, especially in AI? Yeah, I think it's absolutely true that just the pa the pace of these cycles and new technologies is increasing. And so I think if you're one of these companies, ev everybody, as we were talking about earlier, Fareed, everybody needs an AI strategy. Yeah, I think what that means for everybody is like a whole spectrum. A lot of times when people are starting like an AI group or they have an AI initiative, all that means is that's basically trying to get every group in the company to start to start just trying out AI tools. Right. And, and it's just a top-down directive to start evaluating the products and start talking to the startups, et cetera. And obviously that drives, that's the corporate version of novelty effects yep. when you have a top-down 
version of everybody's got to try yeah. AI products now. Yeah. But everybody's roadmap happened. has AI stuff in it. AI, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. yeah, that's right. That's right. I was just having a conversation with some very senior people at Amazon that were telling me it's they're doing annual planning and everyone's plan has to have AI in it. Otherwise right. it's going to get rejected. And so that's a great incentive to just add a bunch of AI into your thing. So I think that's definitely happening. And then I think the other part of it, I would say is if you may also find yourself in a place where AI is going to be hugely disruptive. And if AI is going to be hugely disruptive to your business, and a good example of that is, is if you worked at Adobe, then you have to figure out, okay, I better do the strong form of this and actually build an AI research team and really go for it. And simultaneously also try to maybe partner with startups as a hedge if in case the internal ones leave, but yep. it, it turns your company into a wartime situation. Like yes. you pretty much have to figure it out. Otherwise you're going to get run over. And so I think it, it's good to reflect where your company sits within that yeah. kind of danger zone. I actually saw something pretty cool. There was a interesting access of what jobs are the most likely to be replaced by AI. And one of it, and the axes were like people facing, people facing down to internal. Yeah. And then the other one was like, is it very novel, new work, or is it routine work? And obviously people facing novel work, that's like re reasonably well defended. And versus if you're doing inwards facing routine work, yeah, that's probably going to get automated away. And I think there's something, there's a similar access that you could probably put together for companies as well, right? As a company, if you are doing, if you're highly horizontal and what you're doing is highly routine, then yeah, that's not great. If you are highly vertical and what you do is is much more specialized on different workflows, then, then AI is going to be much, much harder. Yeah. And I think my advice for people who are at the earlier stages, because we asked, like, what if you're under resources, just like, don't fight the battle on the grounds of the incumbents. Like we had this, this is a sort of different example, but Slack and Microsoft uh, launched teams. Like we can't beat team Microsoft at Microsoft's game. Like we have to play a different game. We have to find different ways and different sets of differentiation. If our approach to beating them was to integrate with every single piece of software and do first party versions of every single feature and all those sorts of things we're gonna lose. But so we had to focus on an open ecosystem of platforms and building network effects around that and things like Slack Connect, allowing people to connect across organizations to build long-term network effects. There's probably an example of that for each startup as well. What's the narrow vertical, as Andrew pointed out, that the incumbents are not gonna be focused on. What are the types of network effects or lock-in that you can build with your existing customers to drive retention, et cetera. But yeah, so I, I think it's gonna be hard. These are very interesting times. It's certainly the most fun. That's a wrap on our time. I'm gonna ask, I'm gonna take one more question that's actually for me, Andrew, not for you, but Brian, Casey, and I took a bet on where we thought threads, the Instagram Twitter clone would land in terms of usage by the, I think the end of this year, someone who's a long listener of the pod obviously asked where that bet landed. I saw today that threads has 150 million MAUs and is growing. <laughs> I don't know what I said it would be at a billion. And what I said was it will be at a billion or Zuck will cut it. But I don't remember what the time frame was. So we will do a follow-up pod on where we all predicted threads to be in a future episode, I promise. But last thing here, Andrew, this has been awesome. You've been like, this has been super fun conversation. I hope everybody left with something incredible and interesting to think about. And hey, remember... People, it is people facing and novel if you're doing great product work. So you should have a lot of opportunities to grow your careers and build with that. So I hope that's good advice to wrap on. Andrew, anything else you want to uh, plug or share before we wrap here? No, amazing. Th thanks everyone. And uh, glad to be on here. Thank you for hosting Freed. All right. If you like this, it will be, you want to re-listen, it will be on the Unsolicited Feedback podcast stream shortly. I'm not sure exactly when, a couple of days at the most, when we get our edit together. And if you are interested in these types of topics, like I said, we have almost 40, 50 episodes. I don't know how many exactly on many of these and other topics, including a number with Andrew, which are awesome from our series finale last season. So check it out. Thanks for coming. And thanks to everyone for uh, attending Ref AI. This has been a fun right. conference. Cheers. Awesome. See you guys.